All right, and uh, welcome back. In this section, which I've entitled Less Frequently Encountered Oracle Constructs, we're going to take a look at five topic areas. Uh, User-defined types, collections, large objects, performance tuning, and then ultimately XML. None of these is used <laughs> real frequently on your day-to-day -day lives, but it's becoming more and more so, particularly with the user-defined types and collections in XML. Uh, performance tuning is probably becoming less important on a day-to-day -day basis as hardware becomes cheaper. You're not going to spend $100,000 on an Oracle performance guy when you could just throw a $5,000 box at it instead. It's just a whole lot easier. All right, uh, a couple of caveats before we begin on these. I have designed and programmed databases for about 25 years. Up to this point, I have seen a total of zero object-oriented databases in production. They are mostly theoretical still at this point. Some doctoral candidates thesis, and that's probably the extent of it. I have seen uh, quite a little use of XML, uh, particularly building XML files from relational tables and then using those XML files as temporary storage as associated with some application, that's real common. In addition, uh, performance tuning used to be a huge portion of my life. It is no longer a big part at all because as I suggested, people are just much more uh, ready to say, well, buy a bigger box or buy five more boxes because Phillips is expensive, bringing him in here at XD number of dollars a day. Okay, so much for the caveats. One more thing, um, what we're going to talk about here with respect to user-defined types and object orientation is not what we would refer to as a classic object-oriented model, as one thinks of in uh, 3GLs like C or C++ or something like that. So what we're really looking at here is object-relational. Um, no big deal, still got all the same functionality. Um, class, inheritance type behavior, some but not full polymorphism. So we'll, we'll check it out. Let's get inside. All right, let's start at the start by creating a simple address object. Syntax is real straightforward. Create type object name, keyword object, and then a list of fields and their associated data types. Okay. Let's try nesting these guys now. Now we're creating a customer type object with first and last names as var cars, date of birth as a date, and the primary address field is of type address type, which we just created above. Cool, I can see how this is gonna work. All right, that was pretty easy, but hey, aren't objects supposed to be made up of both attributes and methods? Sure. Let's go ahead and add a method to our customer object type. Check out that syntax. We're adding a member function named getCustomerAge, and it returns a data type of number. Eh, all right, pretty straightforward. But where do we define that function? Well, in an object body definition. Check out this syntax. In particular, check out the line member function, function name, return number, is my age number. Well, the first section of that basically just a declaration on the syntax we used in the define above. Second half just declares a local variable of type number. Go ahead and read down the code. We then proceed to set the value of that variable in our select statement and throw it back with the return keyword. Not too bad. All right, now let's add another level of complexity to our user-defined object. Let's use this customer object as a component of a greater object customer table. Syntax here is real simple. Again, we are just nesting our user-defined types a little deeper. Here, our table contains a customer type, 
which in turn we know contains an address type. Now I want to do a describe on this table to see if it gives us our hierarchy of nested objects. <laughs> While apparently not an SQL developer, which apparently has got a little bug going on here, because set describe depth 10 is almost certainly not obsolete. Check it out, here's the exact same syntax in SQL Plus and it's working just fine. Okay, next thing is to move on to some DML on our object tables. You're all OO programmers, so you should be very comfortable now with DML with an object table requires an associated constructor. Good news, you don't have to create them yourself. They're simply named after the associated type. Uh, an example here will make things perfectly clear. Check out this insert statement. Nothing new until we get to the list of values. See our use of the constructor name? in our case customer type before the list of customer type fields. Also note we have an associated address type constructor and its associated field values. Looks like it worked fine so let's run a little select star to see what is actually happening now inside our table. Well excuse me developer that was pretty lame. I would have sworn my older version did that properly. All right, let's jump back over to SQL Plus to see how it really is supposed to be done. Now that's better. Thank you, SQL Plus, for saving my example. And developer, please get yourself fixed. You are seriously messing up my user-defined types example. Finally, let's show how you select specific fields from our nested objects. All right, pretty straightforward. The only thing to remember is we use customer and primary address in the dot notation and not the corresponding customer type and address type syntax. By the way, the table alias here is required syntax. If you think about it, it makes sense. If you're going to use dot notation, then you need to reference the root of that tree. Finally, to grab the value of that embedded method, we use this syntax. Good news, apparently this code works because I will very soon turn 59. Yeah, I'm pretty much old as dirt. Alrighty, now let's look at the corresponding update and delete statements. <laughs> no surprises here. We again need that table alias, though. Remember that guy. Anyway, once you see the syntax, it's pretty straightforward. Check out this delete syntax. Should not be surprising at this point, and yes, the table alias is required. Nothing to do here but memorize that syntax, and, and you're off and running. All right. What if we had a table made up of exclusively of a single object type and no other attributes, i.e. an object table? Let's take a look at this sales item table made up exclusively of the object sales item type. Shouldn't be any real surprises here. We've seen all this syntax before. Also, check out these insert statements. You could do it with a constructor or by simply providing the values list. I, of course, prefer the values list because it is more self-defining. Now, check this out because this is going to be important for you OO coders. Select value, left paren, SI, right paren, from sales items SI, order by product name. This query is actually returning the rows of the object sales item as true object collections. That sounds pretty sweet if you're a coder. Oh yes, I had to execute this SQL Plus to get this thing to work properly. Hey developer, get your act together please. You're, you're killing me on these user-defined types. Oddly enough, developer does get it right when I add an object attribute after the value keyword as shown in this syntax. Now I want to show you how you can actually establish a foreign key-like relationship between two or more object tables. Check out this next section of code. We start by creating an object table named persons made up of object person types. Next we do the same thing with addresses and object address. And finally the same game for object table named phone number made up of object phone number types. Again nothing new here. But now check out this last create statement where we create a table named customer ob tab made up of a customer ID 
and then some new stuff. First, let's check out the person ref attribute, which references the object person type and has a scope of persons. Basically, what this is is that the person ref attribute of this table is of type object person and must previously exist in the persons table to be included here, i.e., it's a foreign key reference. Net, it's really a pointer to a specific object in the scope table. Let's put some data in these guys. Again, once you see the syntax, it's pretty straightforward. We're actually getting the data for these reference attributes from the scoped table. Yeah, that makes some sense. Finally, here's the DREF syntax. Not surprisingly, this basically goes out to the scope table following the pointer and gets the original value back from which we created our pointer in the ref table. Okay, I can already guess your next thought. Hey Rick, certainly a customer object should be able to have more than one address and no more than one phone number. All right, I agree. Let's fix it. We begin by creating two new object tables made up of the object address and object phone number types respectively. We now create a new table called Better OB Customers with the same customer ID and person ref pointer. Now, however, our third attribute is a pointer to a nested address table. Same thing for our fourth attribute, which creates a pointer to the nested phone number table. The final two lines simply specify how the relational model will physically realize these nested table configurations. Very, very cool stuff. All right, what fun um, user-defined types. As I said, I really think uh, in the future we're going to see them much more heavily utilized, uh, particularly the object-only tables or object tables as we were introduced there at the end. And by the way, in our next lecture when we discuss collections, we're going to go much more deep into nested tables, virtual arrays, things like that. So we'll see a lot more of that. All right, before we move on, though, let's take a look at what we learned in this particular lecture on simple types. You can create your own user type made up of standard Oracle data types by with a simple create type type name object and then a listing. In addition, we then learned that you can nest these things as far down as you want. So replacing those data types with the user defined type you created above, no problem there. We then learned about the insert with a constructor and the select with an alias. Remember that dot notation in the alias on the table is required because it's basically referencing the root of your uh, type tree. We then concluded with a look at object tables. Again, nothing real surprising there other than some new syntax that we kind of got to get our hands around. So that's, that's all good. All right, that concludes our first lecture on user-defined types. Next lecture will be on collections where we're pushing that envelope a good deal further to look at things like virtual arrays, nested tables in much more depth, and the old index by construct. So we'll take a look at that in the next lecture. In the interim, you go out there and you have some fun. But remember, learn something every day.